Hey, hello, hello. I'm Sterling March, and you're here with me on Kingdom Road, my live broadcast every Sunday at 4 p.m., where we discuss the correct interpretation of the kingdom of God. The correct interpretation of the kingdom of God. Today's topic will be specifically about the kingdom. The kingdom of God slash heaven. What exactly is it? Now I know you've been hearing about this kingdom of heaven, this kingdom of God, probably all your life. And you've never, a lot of you probably have never truly understood what exactly it is. And you've never heard from anyone on any pulpit explaining to you except maybe a few maybe you were fortunate enough to have a pastor who really taught on the kingdom but it's rare it's rare but today you will get an informed uh, rendition of what the kingdom of heaven slash God is about I promise you I will give you a lot of information a lot of information and I need you please if you care about the people that are in your life please share with them these messages especially this one I want you to know that this message I'm teaching today is the most important message I will ever teach there is no message that is more important than this this is the message that Jesus Christ preached and this is the one that he asked us to teach he said go and take the message of this kingdom to the world go take the message of this kingdom to the world okay there are many messages out there but they are not the message that Jesus Christ asked for he asked for the kingdom message and that's what we're going to teach today okay I'm going to give you a lot of scripture so please you must pay close attention to everything that I'm going to say because it's loaded I'm telling you it is loaded you know all of my teachings are loaded but this one will open up your mind to a world that will amaze you okay so stay tuned now and like I say before we get going I want you to share if you need to take notes get a pen and pad but you don't really need to because you know it, my my videos are recorded on Facebook and I'm gonna share them on YouTube so you can go to YouTube to my channel or on Facebook to my page and you will be able to view my teaching over and over again as much time as you want to and share it with as many people that you love as many times as you want to and please I encourage you please share it's so important because he said to go and you go by sharing if you believe that what I'm teaching is true because I'm going to give you a lot of scripture to prove that what I'm saying is true then you go by sharing this information with those you love and care about and with a stranger it doesn't matter God asks that you also if you are a believer to go and this is how you go okay so we're going to get right into it the kingdom of heaven by the way you know this is my CD I always invite you to purchase my CD go online to any of the social media sites my song enter the king is playing on 101.9 right now locally in the Bahamas but those of you internationally you can purchase it on any social media site Spotify Amazon Apple music uh, CD baby um, iTunes and you can get this CD it's an awesome CD I'm telling you it's awesome and you can get it for about ten dollars okay and it'll support my ministry and I because I you know I have to pay for these broadcasts to go around the world so you can help me by sowing into my ministry in that way so let's get right into it the kingdom of heaven slash God what are they what are they because they are they are they are they are distinct and different from each other okay there they, they have relation with each other but they're different we'll get into that okay so a king's domain or kingdom that's where we get the word kingdom from a king's domain is a territory owned and ruled by a king which reflects the desire and will of that king 
I'll read that again. A king's domain or kingdom is a territory owned and ruled by a king, which reflects the desire and will of the king. Some kingdoms are a terror to the people, ruled by tyrants, and display a lack of empathy towards its subjects. In God's kingdom, however, its citizens are called exactly that, citizens, not subjects. And all, all are family to the king. In fact, every citizen of God's kingdom is royalty. Every citizen is royalty. They are all kings. This is why he is called the king of kings. Okay? Everybody who professes the name of Jesus Christ as Lord is a king. Okay? Listen to what it says in Revelations 1, 5 to 6. And from Jesus Christ, listen carefully now, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, that's you, if you're a believer, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood, verse 6, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. That's Revelations 1, 5 and 6. Okay? He's the prince of the kings on the earth because we are the kings of the earth, human beings who are the children of God, because he hath made us kings and priests unto God his Father. Okay? God created a race of sons beginning with Adam. Sons. Now, sons, remember I, I told you that whether you're female or male, it doesn't matter. We are all in the Bible referred to as sons. Okay? Sons. God created a race of sons beginning with Adam and placed them in human bodies. But only for the purpose of living on earth. That's important. That means you are not human. You were placed in a human body. Okay? Earth atmosphere requires physical form to dwell on, and man who was created in the image of God, the great spirit, man also being a spirit, required a body because dominion of earth was given to humus, meaning dirt man or human, and only humans can have authority on earth. God's plans for his son on earth was to have authority to rule and reign with the intent to reflect his will. Okay? When he declared in Genesis 1 and 26 that only man would have dominion and rulership, remember what he said in that verse? Let us make man in our image and likeness and let them, he said, not us. He said, let them, meaning man, have dominion over the earth. Okay, it meant that anyone who would have any authority to rule or even exist on earth must be in human or flesh and blood form. Okay, in order for you to exist on earth or have any physical interaction with earth, you must have a physical body. You must. Okay, e listen including even God. Even God needed a physical human body to act on earth. Why? Because he gave dominion and authority to man. And anybody on earth that would have any dominion and authority to do anything supernatural would have to be in a human body or, ha or be human. Okay? And also Satan. Okay? They would both require human bodies to operate on earth. 
either, listen now, and you're probably questioning that because you're saying, well, didn't God do things as God and not in a human body? But listen to this now. Either, is, this is the way they would have, have had to do it, and, you ch and you, if, you, if you listen to this, you will realize how he did it. Either by coming to earth in flesh, as Jesus did, or through request by a human, usually by prayer. Remember now, he gave man dominion and authority. That means man can ask God to interact with earth. Because man has the authority to do that. And that's, whenever God did things on earth throughout the Bible, you will, you will notice that he always operated with, with a human. It was either by the request of a human or because a human was in, a human that he desired or had a, had a had purpose in him, was in peril or needed help with something, that's when he acted. Okay? Uh, usually by prayer, a human usually by prayer or by possession of flesh. Remember now, whenever human beings throughout the course of the Bible had any interaction with the angels, what, what would they see? They wouldn't say, they, the Bible would not say they saw an angel, they would say that they, they saw a young man or a man or a man shining in, in bright raiment or something like that. But well, these were people that the angels used. These were humans that the angels used. Okay? That's how they were able to operate on earth. The Bible, when the Bible, every time the Bible refers to an angel doing something on earth, it would say a man in bright raiment or a man, some, something to do with, 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 with a man. That's how, they would, that's how they would appear to humans as men. But beautiful, beautiful man, it would say, or bright shining, as, you know, as the sun, you know, or something like that, you know. But they would be, they would be humans. They would, that the devils would use. That, sorry, that the angels would use, and also the devil, also Satan. Remember now, Jesus had to pull Satan out of people by exercising him out of people and making him come out of people. Because he was using people to do his will. Either people would allow him to, or people were, for some reason, would be susceptible to him being able to enter, enter them and taking over their bodies. And that's what he did. Remember the man who used to throw himself in the fire and when God pulled him out, when Jesus called him out, he went into the peaks. Okay, you, you see what he had to do? He, he asked Jesus to send him into the pigs because he needed to be in flesh. He couldn't just come out and just be in the air. He had to go into flesh. And then the pigs ran down the mountain and killed themselves. Okay, and, like I said, including even God. Jesus the Christ alluded to this fact that he needed a body when he stated to his father in scripture in Hebrews 19 and 5. This is what he said. Wherefore, at least this is what Paul said about Jesus. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, this is what he said to his father, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body thou hast prepared me. Okay? He was giving God thanks for giving him that body. The same body that he received from his earthly mother, Mary. Mary, remember now, Mary was only a vessel. She was only a vessel, okay? But he got his body from her. And that body, he, he gave thanks to the Father for it. Okay, because the Father used Mary to bring him into the world. Okay? This he said because his mission was predicated on exactly that. A human body that would allow him authority to perform dominion of man-mandated miracles, as we call them, and for the perfected redemption of mankind. Okay? He needed that body to come and do the mission that he came to earth to do. Okay? To perform miracles through the power that he gave to man through dominion, 
in Genesis 1 and 26, it was him, Jesus as the word, who gave man dominion and authority over the earth. And so he had to come in the form of a man so that he could use that same dominion and authority that he gave to man to do the miracles that he did while he was on earth. That's how he was able to do those things. By faith and through the, the, the dominion and authoritative mandate he gave to man. Okay, he used the very thing he gave to man, he used. And that's one of the reasons why he gave it to man, because he knew one day he would have to use it. Okay, now the difference of the kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Listen to the difference now. The phrases kingdom of heaven and kingdom of God are used interchangeably in the Bible. They may seem the same, but are quite different. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is the place where God resides. That's where God lives. In heaven. Okay? He never promised heaven to man. Never. We, you know, from, from, from I was born, I, I always hear that we were going to heaven. That's not true. God never told man that he was going to heaven. He told man, I go to prepare you a place. He never said heaven. Heaven is where God lives. And his angels. The earth he gave to man. Okay. The kingdom of God. Is where he placed his sons on earth. To rule and have full dominion. It is. Listen to this now. It's an important statement. It is the offspring of the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is the offspring of the kingdom of heaven. As man. A God. Is the offspring of God. So God created the kingdom of God on earth for his for the son of God Adam okay Jesus the Christ as the word in heaven created earth to be the kingdom of God for his brethren humankind as a colony of heaven reflecting it in power authority and submission to God alone Okay? This is what it says in Colossians 1 and 16 about Jesus as the Word. Before He came to earth, He was the Word. He was only Jesus when He came to earth. He was never Jesus in heaven. Okay? This is what Colossians 1 and 16 says about Him, the Word. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created and exist through him and for him. This is the word now. Jesus as we know him. It was him who created all things. In heaven and on earth. Everything except the Father. Okay, the scripture says that he, Jesus, all the word, as he was before he was Jesus, was the firstborn of creation. God the Father made him. He was the firstborn of creation. Okay. And he created all things. It was him who did the creation of heaven and earth. He was the first thing and the only thing that God created. And then he created everything else. God created him as a creator, to create all existence as we know it, mankind. The only thing that existed before he created it is God the Father, who created him. Now don't let that confuse you, okay? You can go back and you can listen to that again, okay? So, why did he do it? God knew, okay? That by giving all intelligence, this is God, the word now, Jesus, before he was Jesus, in heaven. He knew that by giving all intelligent beings, he created a choice to choose between good and evil, including the angels. Remember, he created all these things. Jesus, the word, created all these things. Okay? He knew that by giving all intelligent beings a choice to choose between good and evil, including the angels, he could comprise a community of beings who would, because of that choice, 
and by choosing good, reflect His glory for all eternity as in the book of Revelation. Okay? All that is saying is that He knew that by giving everything, everybody He created, and everybody He created was intelligent. Every, um, how should I put it? Every being He created other than the animals okay were intelligent beings that had a choice the, the ability to choose between good and evil and he wanted them to choose good and of those who choose good over evil he would create a community of beings who would reflect his glory and that's what that's that's what this whole thing was all about god creating a a race of beings who would reflect his glory. That's what he wanted. Sons that would be like him. Okay? Deuteronomy 30 and 19 says this. I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you this day. This is what he said to the Israelites, to the prophets. That I have said before you, life and death, the blessing and the curse, Therefore, you shall choose life. He gave them his counsel, his advice. His sound advice. You shall choose life in order that you may live, you and your descendants. Now, this advice was spoken to the Israelites. Okay? But it's given all throughout the Bible, beginning with Adam, concerning the tree of life and the tree of death, good and evil. Remember now, in the garden with Adam, God gave Adam a choice. He put the tree of life in the garden. He also put another tree in the garden. And he said, this tree you cannot eat from. He told them he didn't, allow, he didn't stop him from eating from any other tree. And in that garden was the tree of life. Had he eaten from that tree, nothing would have been able to stop him. But he ate from the wrong tree. The tree that he was forbidden to eat from. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because he did not want Adam to, to have that ability to choose that. Because the line between good and evil, where God is concerned, is too thin for man to understand. And it still is that way today, with God. Because in the Bible, the in the, in the Bible, we, have, we know of instances where it says that God had to repent of the evil that he was, what he, that he was about to do. And, and that's in the Bible at least two or three times. Now, God is not evil. But the Bible says he had to repent of the evil. Which means that only God understands that the line between good and evil is too thin. Because sometimes... What is good is not always what is good. And what is bad is not necessarily bad. But man does not understand that. And so God may do something that we call evil by human definition that is not necessarily evil. It may be for the greater good. Okay? And sometimes men would do things that they've considered to be good but may not necessarily be good for the long haul. And, and because that line is too, so thin, God, just, God wanted man to simply obey. He said, listen, it is better for you to just obey me. That's all. If you obey me, you'll live forever. You'll have everything you need. You'll have a perfect life. Because you cannot interpret that line. And I'm telling you, do not eat from that tree. Do not go there. Just obey me. Okay? And that, that was what God was giving. Like I tell you, he was giving all, he was giving man, like all is, is, is the beings he created, intelligent beings he created, a choice. And he's still giving man this, to, that choice today. He said, choose God or man. Choose God or mammon. 
It is your choice. Think carefully, but I'm giving you advice. Choose God. Choose life. And anyone who's just, who chooses contrary to that goes to hell. It's as simple as that. Okay? That's not, that's not complicated. God knows better than any human being what's good for them. And he's saying, let me guide your life. Because I understand things that you don't. But you, you will have to encounter these things. But I want you to know from this day forward, he was telling to Adam, this will be a choice that will come up in your life from time to time, good and evil. But I want you to, to know today, I'm telling you today, do not choose, make that choice to have that knowledge. Just do what I say, and you'll be fine. And every time it comes up that you have to make this choice, you go back to what I said. And that's the same thing for us modern Christians today, believers today. Go back to the Word and see what the Word says about it. You don't need to even make that choice. Just go to the Word and do what the Word says. Let the Word choose for you. It's as simple as that. When it comes to that issue, good and evil. Because it's, it can be confusing. I'll give you an example. Let's say you, you're driving down the street one day. You pull up on a corner on the light. A young man comes up to your car and he asks you for money. Now you could see from how he looks from his appearance that something is, something is not right. Most likely he, he's on drugs. And we see it all the time. Okay? Well, if you give him money, now he's poor, he needs food, he may be really hungry, but if you give him money, what do you think he's going to do with that money? He's not going to buy food. He's going to go buy drugs if that's what his problem is. Now, did you do something good? No, you didn't. You actually hurt, hurt him by giving him money. And the money that you give him may be the very money that he uses to go and buy his final hit. And kill himself from that drug. Because in, a, in your attempt to do something good that you thought was charitable, you did the wrong thing. You see? That's why you must allow God to lead you. You must allow his Holy Spirit to lead you. The right thing to do in that instance was, you ask. You get, see, you got to get involved. In it. You, if you really want to help someone, you can't just, just throw money at them. You got to speak with them. Ask, what's, what's the matter, young man? And he'll tell you, I'm hungry, miss. I, I just want something to eat. Well, then, you just tell him, just, okay, but you wait right here. What you want to eat? Let me go and get you something to eat. And you go and you get him something to eat, and you bring it back to him. He has a meal that day, and he doesn't get any drugs from anything you give him. You see? Be led by the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes... Good and bad is not as clear as you think. Okay? And there are many other instances like that that you have to be careful of. Let's move on. Okay? I hope I helped you a little bit there. Now, but he wants us to use our ability to choose wisely. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Only be careful. Be careful. That this liberty of yours, see, I just, I just explained that to you just now. This is what it says in 1 Corinthians 8 and 9. Only be careful that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. I gave you the perfect example of that just now. You've got to be careful when you're making your choice between good and bad. Because you don't know. Sometimes what is good is not always what is good. Or not always what is right. Doing something good is not always right. You understand? It's not always the right thing to do at that moment. In another instance it may be, but in that particular moment it may not be. 
So you got to be led by the Holy Spirit. Okay? Must be led of God. The utopia all men seek is also desirable to God and shall come to pass at the end of the age. All men want that perfect life. And this is what God says. The kingdom offered to all men was manifested in the coming of the king himself. He brought the kingdom with him, Jesus, when he came to earth, who came to restore the same, the kingdom, because he had previously given it to man at his creation, when he declared his dominion over the earth and breathed himself, the Holy Spirit, into man to provide him with his connecting power and authority, his signet ring, if you will. Remember, the king would always give the, the, his emissary who would be doing his will wherever he went over in, 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 the, in the country. He would put his ring on him. Remember, remember Pharaoh put his ring on, on Joseph? That's what God giving his dominion power to man was like. Like God putting his ring on Adam's finger. So that anywhere Adam go, that ring would signify the power and authority he had from God. Okay? Implicating that only by this connection, the Holy Spirit, could man have this power, and that connection could only be maintained through a righteous relationship with God via faith and obedience. That's why God asked that we trust and obey Him. Trust and obey. He's saying, trust me. Every decision that you need to make, let me guide you in that. That's why he wants to give you his Holy Spirit, because you will not make the right decisions. Okay? And it's important that you make the decisions that are necessary, that are, that are in alignment with obedience to him. Okay? Because obedience to him signifies your righteous connection with him. And that's what he wants you to have. You need to have that in order for you to be saved. And the only way you can get that is through Jesus Christ, by accepting him as your Savior and trusting and obeying him. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So if you're not keeping his commandments, he is saying, not me, that you don't love him. Okay? When Adam ate of the tree of good and evil, which he was forbidden by God to do, he lost the Holy Spirit. Okay? His connection with God, his signet ring, fell off, so to speak. And dominion power, who cannot indwell a sinful, unrepentant human. The Holy Spirit cannot indwell, who gives, the Holy Spirit who gives dominion power, cannot indwell a sinful, unrepented human. And so when he ate of that tree that God told him not to eat from, he lost his connection. He lost the Holy Spirit because of that one disobedient act. Okay? And he, he, in order for him to get the Holy Spirit back, he would have to be redeemed. Okay? The only way a sinful human can be reconnected to God is via atonement, Redemption and the restoring of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. Okay. Temporary atonement and redemption was done many times for the Israelites. But the blood of sinless animals was not sufficient for permanent restoration. Okay. They, remember they, they sacrificed hundreds of thousands of animals because they were continually sinning. Their main sin being idolatry, they were worshipping idols. Continually, the Bible says, from they came out of Egypt, they were worshipping idols. They never stopped. And no matter how much God punished them for it, they would still, would, they would repent for a while, go and, 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 and sacrifice an animal, make atonement, and then they would go a short time, they would go right back into it and have to do the whole thing all over again. Because an, a, an animal cannot provide permanent atonement only a human could do that for a human okay a sinless human was needed because only a sinless human could provide perfected 
everlasting atonement for a human. Okay, this is where it's getting good now. Keep listening now. This was a dilemma for man. There were no sinless humans. So, when Adam sinned by disobeying God, God, God himself made atonement for Adam with an animal. Remember the Bible says he gave Adam the skins of an animal for clothing. God killed an animal, used its blood for the atonement of Adam and Eve, because they confessed their sins. And the Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He did, but that atonement he made for them was only temporary. Okay? And there was no human he could use who was without sin to give them permanent atonement, redemption. Okay? This is what it says in Romans 3 and 23. For all have sinned and continually fall short of the glory of God. So, where would this impossible sinless human come from? We needed a sinless human to save us. And there was none because all men had sin. From Adam sin and Eve sin, they only could produce sinless, sinful, sorry, humans. Humans were born from them with the nature of sin. And couldn't help themselves. Okay? But in order for us to, for them to receive salvation in order for us to receive salvation we needed a sinless human to die for us just like how the animals would die they would sacrifice the animals we needed a sinless human to sacrifice himself for us or we would have all been slated for hell can you imagine that every human being on earth that ever existed on earth was slated for hell because all were born in sin and all sin in Romans 3 and 23 what I just read all sin and fell short of the glory of God all temporary atonement was not enough it was not enough because we, 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 we continually sin and we would continually need that and if you sinned and in between, you were having the opportunity to, 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 to make that atonement, died, you went to hell. So, this was a dilemma. We needed a sinless human. So, God did the most amazing, incomparable, unfathomable thing that no man or demon could have imagined. Listen to this now. This, 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 is how, this is why I love God. That's why I believe in this Bible, you know. Because ain't no human being could, 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 could think of this. Could come up with this. No way. Human beings today don't even understand, don't understand this. No human being could have come up with this. He would come to earth. Listen to this now. Listen carefully. He would come to earth as that sinless man. That man needed for his perfect redemption. And give himself for the atonement of man by dying on the cross as the necessary price, death. That was the price required according for sin according to the law. This is what it says by Romans 6 and 23. For the wages of sin is death. That's why animals had to be killed. Something, anytime man sinned, in order for him to be atoned for or redeemed, something had to die. Okay? For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay? So, in order for him to fulfill the law, according to the law, God had to provide a lamb for man but it couldn't be an earthly lamb 
Okay, and you know God ain't provide no earthly lamb for the for the sins of the world. That ain't good enough for God. If God do it, he can, he, he's going to do it the, the, the most perfect way because he's perfect. And that's what he did. He would allow creation to he, the creation he made to kill him. He allowed man to kill him. To save it from the eternal damnation he was scheduled for because of Adam. And instead give it eternal life, man, just by it receiving the gift of salvation by faith. That's all. Jesus will come to earth and he would come as a sinless man. How did he do that? Even though he came through a sinful woman, Mary, his mother, he still remained sinless. How? Because he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Bible says with God anything is possible. Because he was conceived by, he was made, created with use of the, by utilizing the Holy Spirit. He would come through a sinful womb but still have no sin. Why? Because he only needed Mary as a vessel. That's all. He only needed Mary as a vessel to come through. He got nothing from Mary. Nothing. He only came through Mary. Because he was not conceived by Joseph. He wasn't conceived by a man with a woman. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit who needed, who didn't need anything, any woman. But did need a woman to come, a human body to come through. And that's why he remained sinless. Remember now, this is why God was so upset with Adam. Because, and I've exp I explained this to you all before. I know what I know some of you know what I'm gonna say. This is why God told Adam, because you have listened to your wife and ate of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, cursed is the ground. In other words, you have lost your dominion. He was telling Adam, even though Eve went and eat that fruit and sinned, as long as you didn't sin by eating the fruit too you would have still been able to produce sinless sons and daughters through her sinful womb, just like how Jesus did it. Why? Because you, he was saying to Adam, have me in you, my Holy Spirit, or had me in you before you ate the fruit. You had me, I remember, I, remember I breathed myself, myself, my Holy Spirit into you. You would have been able to produce sinless offspring through her sinful womb. Because you only needed her body to produce my sons through. Just like Jesus only needed Mary to come through. And that's why he was so upset with Adam. And he said, why? And I'm paraphrasing. Why did you listen to your wife? Everything would have been cool. We could have, I, could have, I could have made atonement for her and redeemed her. But now that you have sinned, you cannot produce sinless offspring. But that wasn't a problem for God. He was just teaching, giving him, giving him the full lesson of why what he did was so detrimental to the salvation of man. To the dominion of man and his own dominion he was telling Adam you've lost your dominion now now you got to go to the soil and work hard now you can't command the soil now to produce food for you you got to go and use your hands now and what he told him by the sweat of your brow you shall eat bread now in other words you shall have to farm this land to produce wheat for you to make your bread now 
You don't have dominion power anymore to tell the earth what to do. Okay? And the Bible says the earth went to, into a period of frustration because of it. Because she lost her leader. Adam was her leader. It was him who was given dominion over her. And when she lost him, she lost all her direction. And the Bible says she went into a period of frustration and futility. She was alive. She is alive. The earth is alive. She is our mother. And she went into a period, the Bible says, as in childbirth. Pain as in childbirth. Because she lost her son. Who she was given the connection to. To lead her. Was yanked from her. Through his sin. Now, only if something that's alive could experience futility, frustration and futility, okay? So the earth is alive, okay? So like I said, he would, he would allow the creation he made to kill him, okay? Now, understand this. That was no easy feat for Jesus. Some of you don't, may not understand why Jesus was so, why he went through so much suffering during that time. Listen to me. Okay? Jesus is God. He was the Word, remember? What does it say in John? In the beginning was God, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among men. Jesus was God. He was the Word, but He was God. He wasn't called Jesus then, but He is God. Part of the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Okay? God now. He's God. Think about this now. And He's God now. Because He's been resurrected. He's gone back to heaven. And He's God. Okay? By coming to earth in human form. Listen now. He had to take off his glory. That means all his power, he had to take that off and leave it with the Father. The power and the authority of God in him, he would have to leave behind with his Father. Listen to the statement now. Without this power, he would not be able to return himself to his former glory. He would not be able to. Because he made himself fully human when he came to earth. Fully human. He did not have the power to return himself to God's status. He would have to trust his father to do it. Now, he never experienced anything like that. That was hard. He was totally vulnerable. If he, had, if he had submitted himself to one of Satan's temptations, that would have been it. All over. All over. For us, for mankind in total, there would be no salvation for mankind if he had submitted to even one of Satan's temptations. Because he would have failed in his mission. He would have sinned. Okay? Another reason, listen now, was as God, he could not come through human flesh. He couldn't come through Mary with his full glory. A human body, Mary, could not contain him as God in his full glory. He had to take that off to come through her because he would have destroyed her if he tried to come through her in his full glory. Remember now, you may recall, he allowed Moses only to see his back parts because no human can even look upon him and live. This is in the Word. The Bible tells us this. So he had to take off his glory. Okay? Just as importantly, he removed his glory, and this is, this is, even, this is the most important part concerning us. Just as importantly, he removed his glory 
to achieve the same status of man who lost his glory in Eden when Adam sinned in order to demonstrate to man, us, the methodology to regain our glory as he would do his. In other words, he took his glory off and he was saying to man, watch me. You are my brother. I'm only the first among you. That's all Jesus was, you know, the first of us. He's just like us. We were created in his image and likeness. He created us in his image and likeness. And I'm going to read you a scripture concerning that. But he took his glory off. The same glory we had, because he gave it to us, so that he would be of the same status as us and demonstrate to us how to get that glory back, how to get dominion back. He did it all for us. And he did it without with knowing full well, fully well that he would not be able to return himself to his God status. Listen to this now. At least the status that he had in heaven, he was still God, but he removed his glory. Okay? He was fully human and he was fully God, but he didn't have his, his godly power. He took that off and left that with the Father. Okay? Remember when he said what he said on the cross? Father, why have you forsaken me? It was nothing he could do. Once God removed himself from him, by taking his glory off from him, that was God removing himself from him. But he, he didn't feel that until he was about to die. That's when he realized, and in the Garden of Gethsemane, when, he began to, when it began to get closer to him, what he was about to do, the Bible says he, he cried drops of blood because he began to feel what it meant now as a human about to die. And from a, from, a, from a deeper understanding of it, because it was him who created death. So he fully understood what he was about to do. Unlike us, when we're about to die, we don't understand what it is, because we don't even know when we're going to die. He knew he was about to die, and he knew what it meant. And for him, who had never experienced anything of that kind, or... It was unfathomable, unfathomable for him to even have to experience that. But his knowledge of what it meant to die, because it was him who created dying, that made him cry drops of blood. And it made him feel totally abandoned on that cross. coming from the state of full power and authority that he had come from. He had no power to regain what he had taken off in heaven. He had to trust his father. And that was frightening for him. Why? Because he was human. Fully human. Okay, listen now. The same glory he and man had from the Father. Okay? This is the glory that he took off. The same glory he and man had. This is what he said to his Father concerning that glory. Listen, I'm telling you, all, when I tell you all that it's the same glory, we are just like him. But we don't know it. You got to study this word to know this. This is what he said in John 17 and 22. I have given to them the glory and honor which you have given me. This is what he's saying to his father now. Okay? That, and this is what he was saying to his father when he created man. Long before this, before he went to the cross. This is what he's saying, saying to, what he was saying to his father concerning what he did. He was saying it in John 17 and 22, but he was saying, this is what I have done, Lord. From I created them. I have given them the glory and honor which you have given me. Remember now, he didn't go to the cross yet when he said this. So this wasn't something that he was about to do. He was saying he already, I have, I have already given them 
the glory that you gave me. He said, that they may be one, just as we are one. The same glory. And he took it off to show us how to get it back. So that we could get it back in him. So that when he, when he, when he, would, when he would be resurrected after he went to the cross and did his, his, his mission, and he was resurrected fully as God, then he said, now in me is your power to be returned to your God status as I made you a God. He was resurrected as God and he said, in me now, by accepting this gift I have given you, I am offering you to be resurrected in me, to be born again in me, you can have your status as a God again too. Because remember, man lost his God status when Adam sinned. Adam lost his God status. He was created a God. The Bible says when the Holy Spirit was breathed into him, he became a living soul, alive in God. He was the only one who was breathed into. Mary was never breathed into. Only him. He alone was alive in God. That's why God told him, why did you listen to your wife? She is a different status from you. You are a God. Okay. In the scripture, in this scripture, Jesus revealed, sorry, sorry. And then he said something after he said, I have given them the glory and honor that you have given me. Then he said something remarkable that most readers fail to grasp when they read the Bible. This is what he said in John 17 and 23. Listen to this now. Important statement so you can know who you are. Okay? This is what he said to the Father. I in them and you in me. He was continuing the statement in John 17 and 22 where he said that they may be one. I've given them the glory and honor that you have given me that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me that they may be perfected and completed into one so that the world may know listen to this now that you have sent me and have loved them just <laughs> as you have loved me in this scripture Jesus revealed that as far as God is concerned humans are as important to him even as his firstborn begotten son I'm telling you, we don't understand who we are. We think we're human. We're not human. We are only placed in a human body. We are spirits, sons of God, made just like the first of us, Jesus, the firstborn of creation. Jesus is simply the first of many sons. This is what it says in Romans 8 and 29. Okay? For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, this is the Father now, to be conformed to the image of his Son. For those whom he foreknew, that means he knew you, child of God, before you came out of your mother. Before the world was created, he knew you. And he predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. Remember, the Bible says we were made in his image and likeness. So that he, his son, would be the firstborn among many. That's all. Jesus was simply the firstborn among many. He is God. You are a God. But you will die like mere men, David said. Because you don't understand. For lack of knowledge, you're going to perish. Because you don't know. And you won't study. God said, study to show yourself approved. Meaning, study so that you will know who you are. So I can bless you with what I have given you. I can't give it to you if you don't know it. And don't believe in it.
study so you could be approved for your blessing. Keep listening. Then he came to earth to be just like us for the mission. To return to us what he had given to us. Listen to this very important statement. The only power he would have as a man when he came to earth is the same power he gave to man at his creation. The power of dominion over the earth that can only be wielded by a man according to his declaration in Genesis 1 and 26 when he said, let us make man in our image and likeness and let them have dominion over the earth. Okay? The king came to, earth, he, to the earth he made to restore power to mankind. The same dominion power he had previously given. Isn't that amazing? He only he came to earth to give us back what he had given us. He would not let us exist without it. Because once he declared it, once it came forth, from, remember now he's the word. Once he speaks, that becomes a law. And nothing could stop it. They could interrupt it for a time, if he allowed it, and he did allow it for a reason. But it could not be stopped. Okay? It could not be stopped. Dominion would be in man's hand. And again, it's man's choice to have it or not to have it. The choice of man. He began his ministry at age 30 with these words. In Matthew 4 and 17, it says, From that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent! For the kingdom is of heaven is at hand. Power manifested in the form of a kingdom again, where its citizens would have all authority in the earth to speak anything into being. As long, listen now, as long as it was within the will of God. That's why you can't, even as a child of God, just do anything with this power or say anything and it happens. It has to be in the will of God. Okay, it has to be in his will. That's why it's not common, even among believers. Because he didn't ask you to do those things he did, even though he said you could do them. He didn't ask you to do them. What did he ask you to do? He said, T I only, I, I, I'm only giving you one commission. Take the message. Go. Go into the world and take this message. I need them to know. And how will they know if you don't go? He said, just the knowledge alone, he says, will return the sons of God to my father and bring my brothers back into the fold as the sons of God. Okay? Now, he gave us a kingdom, not a religion, which is what we've made it. Okay? Because of the misunderstood spiritual aspect of it, the kingdom, along with the required rituals of atonement and worship during the law covenant with the Jews, they originally made it into a religion. Okay? Because of all those rituals where they would have to, you know, God gave them over 600 laws and they would have to do all kinds of rituals and stuff for atonement and how to worship in certain ways and all that stuff. Because of all of that, they started worshiping those things. They started worshiping the rituals and tried to obtain salvation by the rituals. Uh-uh. You can't get it like that. Okay? Since then, the world has followed this practice in error. Everybody now practicing a religion because the Jews started practicing a religion. Just doing stuff ritually. They would regularly do things, even though they couldn't keep the law. So the the rituals and the sacrifices really meant nothing after a while. Because after a while, the Bible said they wasn't even sacrificing. Remember now, he would tell them, you must sacrifice an animal without blemish. They started out sacrificing animals with the sickly animals, the worst of their stuff, the animals. That's what they started sacrificing. Just 
to say they did, they were doing it. They totally forgot what God, how God told them to do it. And listen, you got to follow God's instruction. Only by following the instruction. And you, my friend, who are listening to me right now, must learn the instruction. You must study. So that you will have the knowledge and understanding you need to be a true believer. You can't just go by what people tell you or what you believe. You must know. Study the instruction. The Bible is the instruction. Okay? Firstly, God never asked us to follow the Israelites. And we still following the Israelites. He never, but I'm not. Okay? He never asked us to follow the Israelites, but to follow Christ. Who removed us from the requirements of the law. And secondly, the rituals under the law were symbolic to the real deal to come, which was him. Once he came, there was no need for those things anymore. That's why he said you are no longer under the law. Once he came, the old rituals of the law were permanently fulfilled in him. And his kingdom was to live in and be reflected by the lives of his followers. This is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All those old rituals that the Israelites were doing, he said, all things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Jesus Christ brought a new thing. But we still, even today, still studying and quoting and trying to follow the old things, the law. The decrees and declarations that were given under the law. We still all about in the Old Testament trying to do those things. For what? Those things were given under the law. And even the Israelites themselves couldn't fulfill those things. They failed. He wasn't simply speaking about the individual when he said, All things are passed away, behold, all things become new. But to the entire world and the nation of Israel, who until that time were worshipping the law. The Apostle Paul stated again concerning the redemption of the Christ in Romans 6 and 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For ye are not under the law, but under grace. Under grace. Stop trying to do what the law says. Stop talking about you only supposed to be eating, you only supposed to eat pork, you only supposed to eat no shellfish. Those were things given under the law. What Bible are you reading, some of you? Didn't he just say you are not under the law? So why are you still pushing not to eat certain things, to still observe on certain special days like the Sabbath? These were things that were given under the law. Jesus said, you are not under the law, but under grace. Stop worrying about those rituals. He said, I've already fulfilled those things. I paid the price. The Holy Spirit now indwelling those who receive Jesus as their Lord, leading them to a true fellowship with the Father. That's what this relationship is about now. Being led of the Holy Spirit, not the law. Galatians 5 and 18 says, But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. But, but yet you're still talking about what don't eat certain things and don't work on the Sabbath. And Stop it, man. You're hurting yourselves because you are telling Jesus, I ain't listening to you. This is what the Israelites are still doing today. They're still observing those old practices, what not to eat, what not to drink. What special day you're supposed to observe? No man, listen, every day is a holy day to God. You are commanded to be a worshiper of God every day. Not on no special day. Okay? Yet the modern Christian community is still preaching the decrees and declarations under the law as commandments for their members. Listen. 
Jesus gave two commandments concerning obedience in his kingdom. The conversation went like this after he was asked about the commandments. Listen to what it says in Mark 12, 29 to 31. And Jesus answered him, the person who asked him about the commandments, The first of all commands is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all and with thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like namely this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. Listen. All other commandments given under the law were fulfilled. Meaning, this is what it means when it says he fulfilled them. Meaning the required price for the payment for breach of them or for breaking of them were paid on the cross by Jesus for anyone that believed in him. As long as that individual remained believing in him, they are automatically forgiven for breaching any of those laws. So you're not under them. Okay? His blood has never lost its power. It's still saving souls today. Your faith in Him, listen now, your faith in Him is the key to the door, which He is, to the kingdom. He's the door. Now, defining the kingdom, listen now, we can define the kingdom a little, a little better now. Okay? A little more in depth. I know this word kingdom is not necessarily often heard among people who have never lived under such a political system. Okay? But God's kingdom is a country. Very much like most in political structure in that it possesses most of the systematic programs of governance as those in the world today. Okay? As a matter of fact, most of the countries of the world got their program from the Bible. They won't admit it, but that's where they got most of their stuff from. Okay? It has a constitution, the kingdom, called the Bible. In the Bible, there are all the things that God says we must do and be to be like his son. Okay? Second, it has laws. Firstly, given to the Israelites, then reconfigured by Jesus who only who gave us two. He said, follow these two. All the other laws are contained in these two. Okay? Number three, it has currency provided by the once required tithes. Tithes are not required anymore. So preachers, stop preaching it. You know, well, maybe you know, well, you know what? I'm not going to even, I'm not going to give you a blight. Because if you study the word, you're a preacher, you um, you got to be studying the word, you know that the Bible says that tithes is no longer required. Stop preaching it. Let me tell you something, that's disobedience. Okay? This is what it says in 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. Okay? Let each one give just as he has decided in his heart, not grudgingly, or under compulsion. Remember now, God compelled us to pay tithes before, under the law. And we are no longer under the law. Okay? Not grudgingly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. God wants you to give from your heart. But you feel led as a believer to give. Now, I'm going to help you out, preachers. That doesn't mean that you give less than, than, than you would have given if you were still giving as under the law, the 10%. That's not what that's saying. It's actually saying that if you truly understand or understood what God did for you, you would give, you would give even more than 10%. 
Let each one give just as he has decided in his heart. If you have a heart after God, then you understand what God did for you when he gave you salvation. No amount of money is enough to give to God if that's the case. And you don't have to be afraid to give generously. The Bible says, let him give generously. Because God loves a cheerful giver. Because God will give you back anything you give him. House or land or money. A hundred times. In his, in, when you come into the kingdom. And now. While you still live on earth. This is the word of God. So. This doesn't say suggest that you don't need to give. This is saying that you should give even more. If you understand what he's done. Give according to what your heart tells you that God did for you. And God has done everything for us. Okay? Number four, it has a military in the form of the angels of God who appear all throughout the Bible. This kingdom got everything, man. Okay. It has ambassadorial service of which every believer has been commissioned, just like the nations of the world commissioned their ambassadors. Isn't that amazing? God called us ambassadors. And he commissioned us, he gave us the great commission to go into the world and take the message of my kingdom. And the nations, when they commission, when they appoint the ambassadors, what does it say that they do? They commission them, the same thing, the same word. I tell you, they get everything from God, but they don't want, they, they, they refuse to admit it. They refuse to admit it. Okay? And it has territory. The kingdom of God has territory. Which includes the entire earth and its people. Which are the Lord's. What does the Bible say? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world and they that dwell therein. Everything that you can see and cannot see belong to, the, to God. He is the owner. He is the owner. Okay? Now, what is the message of the kingdom? The message of the kingdom is simply this. Power to control all circumstances has been returned to man as before in Adam. Adam had dominion. Jesus came to give it back to you. The power and ability to control all your circumstances. For good. What did God say? All things work together for good to them that love the Lord. You are in full control of your life if you are in Christ simply by submitting to him. Because he says, because you and me, everything, I don't care how bad it may seem to you, it will still work out for you, for your good. You're not going to fail. You're not going to fail. You cannot fail in me. There is no failure in me. And you and me, you are in me. Okay? but only available to those who believe on his name. There is no other way. This is what Jesus said in John 14 and 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The way, because I am the only way into the kingdom. I'm the door. The truth, because only what I tell you about the kingdom is the truth. He said, don't believe nobody what no one else says unless they are saying what I said. And the life, because eternal life only comes through my salvation. Okay. And he said in John 10 and 9, 10 and 9 as I just said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. He was alluding to the fact that he was a means to another end, his kingdom. So when we preach about this kingdom, 
we must emphasize not just the door, which he is. Most preachers only preach Jesus, but they don't talk about the kingdom, okay? As people, listen now, this is, this is why it's important to preach this message correctly. Jesus rarely preached about himself. He only told you that he was the door, he is the way. But he kept saying, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, the kingdom is like, okay? He is saying, preach about the kingdom, but don't just emphasize me, the door. Because most people will seldom be attracted to a man, which he is, he was, even though he was God. But preach about a country where all your needs are met. What does he say? Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and everything that you need will be added to your life. Listen, if you go around telling people that, and you got them. Because once they accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, they will find out without a shadow of a doubt that their needs will be met. And they will go and spread that good news to others. And that's why he says, don't just preach about the door. Okay? Preach about the needs being met. Tell them what my kingdom is like. And he kept saying that. My kingdom is like, my kingdom is like, my kingdom is like this. The kingdom is like a pearl that a man found hidden in a field. Or a treasure hidden in a field. And he went and sold all that he had to buy that field. Nothing is more important than that. Okay? And that is the practical application to your life. Your needs will be met. If you don't believe anything else Jesus said, just believe that one thing. Your needs will be met. Met. And that's all you need in life, right? That's the practical application of the kingdom. Your needs will be met. We must preach what he preached. He kept repeating his statements, statements about his kingdom, only informing us that he was the way. The book of Matthew. Read the book of Matthew and he'll tell you everything that he, everything that he kept saying about the kingdom was right in there. It indicated his thoughts. Many would repeat, the kingdom is like this, the kingdom is like that. And he would use various scenarios to capture our imagination into this wonderful and most valuable place he was offering. The kingdom of heaven, listen now, must be treated as if it is all things most important to us. And nothing must come before it if we are to experience its benefits and blessings. He empathized, empathized this in the book of Luke. You can't treat this. See, that's the problem with a lot of people, you know. We carry on like kingdom on Sunday, but the rest of the week, we forget about the kingdom. We, we ain't checking. We go right back to what we were before. And everything else is more important than God and his kingdom to us. That's why you ain't blessed. Because you ain't putting it first. He said, put my kingdom first. Seek ye first. Okay? This is what he said in Luke 9, 59 and 62. Listen to this now. I love this. And he said unto another man, follow me. But the man said, and he said, Lord, allow me first to go and bury my father. And listen to what the king said. Look here, Jesus don't play. Jesus said to him in verse 60. Allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and spread the news about the kingdom of God. In other words, burying your father is not more important than this kingdom. He said, let them who, who and me, let them, let them bury him. You come and teach, preach my kingdom. And then he said in verse 61, and another also said, I will follow you, Lord. Yeah, well, this one said, yeah, I'll follow you. But first, let me say goodbye to those at my home. This was his family now. His family. Okay? But Jesus said unto him, look here. I'm paraphrasing. No one who puts his hand to this plow and look back is fit for the kingdom of God. He said, listen, even if your family don't want me, then that's that's their problem. That's their business. If they don't want me, then you better keep your hands on this plow and keep going. Okay? 
I will give myself to them just as I gave myself to you. You have received me, they have to receive me for themselves. But if they don't want me, you better keep your eyes on me. Keep your eyes on my kingdom. He says, you can keep witnessing to them, but you can't let their attitude towards me cause you to forsake what I have told you. Remember what he said in one of his verses? He said, Fathers will turn against sons, sons will turn against fathers, husbands against wives, wives against daughters. That means that if one will, who, sometimes one will know the kingdom and the other won't, and they won't get along. But you, who I have called and received me, he's saying, keep your eyes on the price. Because if you lose this, you lose everything. Even your family, he says, is not more important than me. They're second to me. Make sure you get in this kingdom because hell is, is a real place and you don't want to go there. So even if your family forsakes me, you better not. And you keep, keep on going. Stay on the road. Remember what he says in Matthew 7 and 14? What did he say? He said, straight is the gate. And narrow is the way that leads to life. Remember, he is the life. He said, and few there be that find it. You better be in that few. Only a few find it, he says. I told you the other day, by 2025, sorry, by 2050, I read this, I looked this up in my research, by 2050, over 100 billion people would have died since the existence of humankind. Over a hundred billion people. Of that hundred billion people, you say only a few of them. Only a few will find this life I'm offering. Listen. Put Jesus first. You see, you could put Jesus first and still live a good life. I don't. I, this won't stop you from living a good life. There are many people who think if they become saved, they're gonna stop enjoying life. Where you get that from? Who told you that? Man, life just gets sweeter. Because there's a lot of people out there partying. Let me tell you, don't 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 get jealous of them. Because they partying hard because they know what they got home to face. They don't want to go home to face that. They need to go party to try to forget that for at least for a little while. A lot of people. But listen, you could go out and enjoy life. In love with Jesus. You adjust your life because you want to. And there are things that you won't want to do. Because you don't need to. You don't need nothing to help you forget your troubles because your troubles are, 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 easily, are easily, much more easily to deal with. The Bible didn't say the weapons may not form, you know. It says they will not prosper. All of Everybody has trouble from time to time. But God says, listen, your steps are ordered by me. And I will never allow you to experience anything that you cannot handle. I will see to it that you will never have more than you can bear. And listen, if you know that in your mind, you, 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 you can live this life. Yeah? Pour yourself a tall glass of switcher and sip, sip, sip. You straight. And you don't worry what people are doing. Don't, don't, don't envy nobody because you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what they're experiencing, but you could have bliss. You could enter God's rest, meaning 
all your needs will be met all your troubles will be will be you'll be able to deal with them and you will not have to worry about anybody say do not worry do not worry he said I'll take care of you I will take care of you you mind now again I'll take care of you power to control your circumstances is back in your hands by accepting my gift of salvation it's back in your hands now because I am responsible for you now and you and me are more than a million besides remember remember Elisha Elisha's servant when Jezebel sent her soldiers against Elisha and his servant became anxious so Elisha said to God God show him show him show him what we got just just give him a little glimpse the Bible says that God opened the eyes of that servant and when he looked on the mountains and the hills all he saw were legions of angels legions more than the eye could see he says see show, show him he weren't but them couple of soldiers and you all know what happened to Jezebel the dogs ate her bones in the street they went back to get some a body the next day to bury it there was nothing left but a skull and a hand that's all they found listen to me here success in God only happens when we prioritize him and his kingdom it is the only message by which men can be set free the only one from the bondage of sin and receive salvation salvation is yours and it ain't stressful it ain't cost you nothing it don't cost you nothing nothing only your heart that's all that's all God wants your heart that's all he wants your heart and from then on he will lead you and guide you into how to live and how to act okay so be encouraged man if you watching me it is not too late for you but tomorrow is not promised you don't know what's gonna happen I can walk out this door right now and be shot I guarantee you somewhere in the world maybe even right in my country maybe someone died today millions of people die in the world every day every day and from different countries you don't know who's going to be next even the righteous die but the righteous die in God their troubles are over if you die without God your troubles just getting started and they will never end you are a spirit spirits never die you will live on in eternity with God or you will live on in eternity with Satan where you will suffer and you there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth pain forevermore you don't need that man you 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 get to walk on streets of gold and you can you can you gonna you're gonna take a chance on having pain and gnashing of teeth for the rest of your life you know I remember when I had so much pain one time I I had a gallstone that had to be removed but before it was removed the pain was so bad I had to rock and I didn't know what it was so this was going on for days okay I thought it was gas and I was doing all kinds of things I went to the doctor he told me he gave me bad advice okay it wasn't until I went to another doctor and get a second opinion after another couple of days and he put me through a machine and found that there was a stone in me in my gallbladder 
and he, he went in and he removed it. That pain was so bad I had to walk. You couldn't keep still. You can't you can't sleep and you can't stay still. I had to walk. That pain is a joke. I ain't trying to frighten you, man. Okay? But I'm just telling you to make it right with God today. Go back and listen to this teaching again. And listen to it over and over and over. And please, if you care about anybody, share it with them. I don't care if they say it or not. They may not have heard the message like this. It will strengthen them in case they are about to backslide. Because backsliding is a serious thing. Once you backslide, you can't come back to God anymore. That's in the Word of God. That's it. You cannot come back from back from a backslidden state. Okay? Choose. Life and good or death and evil. God is saying, choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Remember I told you all in my last teaching, God has never refused any man, you know. God has never refused no man. Men refuse him. They decline him. They say no to him. He never says no to any man. He says, you have time to make this decision and make it right. Whatever decision you make will be a result in your destiny. It's not me. It's you. It's your choice. I don't care how you, what kind of life you may have lived up to this point. If you make it right today, none of that matters. He said, as of today, you become my son. You are welcome into my family. With open arms, the angels celebrate, the Bible says. Whenever a human comes to God. No matter how bad they were. No matter what they've done. Because God knows if your repentance is real. Whether you mean it or not. So, He knows. And you can join this family today. Come on, man. Come in. Welcome. Come in, my brother, my sister. Come in. And join this awesome family I'm in. Where all of us are kings. Kings and gods again. As we were originally made in Eden. So, uh, that was be the close of another wonderful teaching, if I may say so myself. Only because it's the truth. It's God's word. I, I nothing, None of this came from me, out of me. I'm only repeating what he said. I'm using, he, he allows us to adopt his platform to teach. And he says, no matter, don't worry about what you will say. When you go before kings, he says, I will speak through you. And that's what he does to those who submit themselves to him. Okay? So God bless you. Listen to it again. Share with your friends, your co-workers, your family, and your groups, WhatsApp, Facebook, wherever, YouTube. Share it, man. Let people know. Okay? And join me next Sunday for another wonderful teaching. God bless you. Have a great day. And be safe out there. And remember... The, the, the pandemic is still ongoing, so wash your hands, observe your distance, and please wear your mask. This thing is not going to go away, you know, because y'all ain't doing what you're supposed to be doing. There are people around the world who will not do these things. How do you expect this thing to go away if you won't do these things? You, and you, it just keeps spreading and spreading and spreading. Be safe out there, man, okay? I love you, but remember God loves you even more. Nobody can love you like him, okay? So God bless you and take care and see you next week. Bye-bye.